I'm, I'm extremely pleased to, uh, uh, to introduce our, our speaker, who is uh, Shannon Clark from Montclair State University. But before I do, I want to just acknowledge that this is a co-hosted uh, presentation uh, with the Society for History and Graphics, uh, which is a, an ongoing kind of collaborative project to discuss the uh, relationship between uh, design and the design professions and understand their context in historical, in historical ways. Is, uh, and, that, and design might be architectural, but more often it's graphic, it's, uh, it's other kinds of, uh, you know, the useful arts, as they used to say. Every month we hold a session somewhere, you know, uh, somewhere in the Baltimore metropolitan region. And uh, I want to invite you, if you're interested in, in design history, I want to invite you to sign our guest register here that you can uh, receive emails on a regular basis. For instance, uh, coming up in October is uh, a lecture called Print Design is Alive and Well, presented by um, Kevin Spurl and Claude Skelton. And this will be at Towson University, is that right? And we'll, you, you can go to our website and see, how, see find, find out about logistics. In November, uh, Patent Medicine, Selling the Cure. Uh, Norm Barker, who I think is in our audience today, uh, will be speaking at uh, Hopkins about that. Um, and uh, in November, A Designed Life uh, at UMBC, presented by Peggy Ray. Uh, she collaborated with some uh, Morgan faculty on a project which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, may not happen, but I think uh, Morgan has had a lot of in influence on what she's going to be showing over there, so I invite you to there. And the list is endless. It's been going on for, what, 12, 11 years? 11. 11 years, every month, so it's really a great uh, program. So, um, again. Okay, so uh, Shannon Clark is a uh, assistant professor of history at Montclair State University. Uh, he received his PhD from Columbia University in 2006. His research focuses on the uh, political, economic, social, cultural, and intellectual history of the 20th century in the United States, and we're going to learn a, a little bit about all of those in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes. Without further ado. Fantastic, Jay. Thanks so much, and thanks you all uh, for being here today. I want to speak about the history of the design laboratory. Uh, which was the first comprehensive school of modernist design um, in the United States, based in New York City, opening in the later part of 1935 and continuing it in its existence um, until the computer is giving me some kind of a strange error message. I'm sorry, hold on for a second. All right. I want to speak just briefly at first about the origins of the school and some of the intellectual and aesthetic influences on the school, um, especially in its initial phases of development. Um, I then want to speak a little bit about the relationship of the design laboratory to ideas about cultural democracy in the United States under um, the New Deal, the design laboratory was initially created as part of the federal arts project of the New Deal, and it's worth thinking about its development and its genesis in the context of broader ideas about efforts to democratize American culture in various ways during the 1930s. I then want us to turn to spend a little bit of time focusing on the design laboratory in the context of issues related to creative labor in the United States during the 1930s. Um, this is a period when, despite mass unemployment, there's a tremendous amount of agitation amongst white collar workers um, in the culture industries. This is the period when you begin to see workers in the motion picture industry, in the print media, in the broadcast media. Um, and in architecture and design and the visual arts begin to organize labor unions, um, right? So there's a kind of a militant approach to thinking about creative labor that very much informs the school's development as well, as we'll see, um, following the termination of its federal funding through the Federal Arts Project, the school is in fact reorganized as a cooperative sponsored by one of these militant um, white collar unions. Um, that flourished in New York City's culture industries during the 1930s. And then I just want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the contested meanings of modernism in the United States um, during the 1930s and the struggles that the faculty and the students at the design laboratory um, engaged in, not just to promote their own particular vision aesthetically of a functionalist modernism, but to also have that functionalist modernism truly represent their left-leaning social and political ideals, um, ultimately bringing them into sort of um, ambiguous 
um, collaborations with institutions, for instance, like the Museum of Modern Art. Um, in New York City, uh, where they're collaborating, but at the same time, the individuals who are most more closely associated with MoMA are trying to sort of build a canon of sort of high modernist as a signifier of kind of elite refinement and status, not as a way of signifying a trend towards social democracy, towards a greater um, socialization of the economy and sort of social provisioning of goods and services, which is certainly um, the significance that the students and faculty of the design laboratory wish to establish for functionalist modernism. Um, then I want to speak a little bit about the problem of patronage. Um, ultimately, this is a very promising institution that left a very important legacy uh, in American education and in American um, architecture and design, well, design more than architecture, um, but where there was a real fundamental problem to actually establish a viable financial basis. Um, for the school, which ultimately results in its demise and its closure by 1940. And then, if time permits, I just want to say a few remarks at the very end about the legacies of the laboratory. Now, the laboratory, the design laboratory, owes its existence to the Federal Arts Project, uh, which is one of four cultural projects that were included within the Works Progress Administration, a New Deal agency that was launched in 1935 um, that represented one of the more significant efforts by the, the um, presidential administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt to cope with massive unemployment during um, the Great um, Depression. Francis Pollock, who is the administrator in charge of art education programs for the Federal Arts Project, ultimately is responsible for sort of coming up with the idea of a design school, um, one that would be targeted not just towards you know, um, the kinds of elementary and secondary education that most of the art projects of the FAP were directed towards, um, but one that would really be focused on professional education, right, on training people who would work as designers of various types. Um, this is just a graphic put out by the FAP um, in late 1936, essentially at the point that employment um, on the FAP nationally was at its peak. I brought 5,200 or so artists um, were on the payroll um, at its peak. All told, the four cultural projects um, of the WPA, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, and the Federal Arts Project at their peak um, employed about a total of 45 to 50,000 people um, nationally right at the end of 1936, which essentially represents the period of sort of peak levels of employment on the four cultural projects. Student registration opened in December of 1935, and it proved to be very popular. On the very first day, they enrolled about 220 students, and it's several hundred additional students who were put onto a waiting list, right, hoping to take advantage of this opportunity for education that um, was free, right? so certainly the price was right, um, but it was also very innovative. Um, this was the first um, comprehensive school of modernist design in the United States. It offered a kind of approach to education and design that was not available elsewhere. Um, and some of the individuals, in fact, who were early students at the school commented um, on how, you know, sort of unsatisfying, um, you know, some of their earlier educational experiences were prior to coming to the design laboratory where they really found felt like you know this is it you know this is the, the kind of sort of rigorous innovative cutting edge um, you know training in various design fields that they've been sort of hoping to find and, not, and sort of not finding at you know existing art schools like Pratt Institute for instance um, you know that was engaged in sort of training commercial artists and designers um, in New York City um, just a photograph of some of the a promotional display being installed um, in Midtown Manhattan just a few weeks after the opening um, of the school, right, with the, the name of the school, a listing of the names of figures on the advisory board, um, and just a photograph here of just a woman um, you know, in the shop. Um, again, a lot of emphasis on sort of hands-on learning by doing in the development of modernist designs. So it's a very central aspect of the schools pedagogy. If we want to think about sort of the influences on the school, certainly, you know, the influences on Francis Pollock, right, again, the administrator who wrote up the initial prospectus, 
um, and certainly the influences on the first group of individuals who are faculty at the school when it first opens, we want to think probably of sort of three main sort of currents of ideological and aesthetic influences on the initial development of the school. One would be sort of the social and cultural analysis that comes out of progressive era thought within the United States and sort of continuing the sort of trend of progressive social and cultural analysis from the turn of the 20th century up into the 1930s. And even here, there's sort of two components. One um, relates to sort of progressive ideas about pedagogy that are very much rooted in the writings of Jane Addams and John Dewey in particular, um, both about education as a whole, but specifically some of what they have to write about various kinds of craft and industrial education, um, stressing um, the educational experience as needing to be one that involves sort of experience um, and you know, a certain amount of experimentation as well, right? Emphasizing sort of learning by doing. It sort of becomes very much of a mantra for the faculty um, at the design laboratory. Shows up time and time and time again in their own writings about what they're trying to accomplish at the school. Um, and very much sort of drawing upon you know, the work of Dewey, the work of Jane Addams as well. Um, a second aspect of this sort of influence of progressive uh, American social and cultural analysis is where or there's a critique of the material culture um, of industrial America, um, in particular the writings of the sociologist Thorsten Veblen. Um, when Pollock wrote up her original prospectus for the school and, and gave it to Holger Cahill, um, who was in fact the director of the National FAP, you know, she listed some of the books sort of essentially as a bibliography. And when she got to Thorsten Veblen's Theory of the Leisure class, she underlined it, she actually wrote stars next to it um, that are sort of handwritten in the copy of the prospectus that she sent to Cahill. Um, and certainly, Veblen's critique of what he saw as kind of the atavistic tendencies of cultural elites, their fondness for historical styles, historical eclecticism, he saw as being essentially backwards looking, as sort of retarding the development of American society and American culture. Um, you know, really preventing the development of sort of cultural forms, including aesthetic forms and design, that would really be appropriate to the way that people were living under the conditions of advancing industrial modernity. Um, and also along these lines, Lewis Mumford, who in many ways is sort of at the peak of his influence in the 1930s with the recent publication of Techniques and Civilization just a year before the design laboratory opened, is another important figure amongst the sort of, this trend of sort of progressive American cultural and, so, and social analysis that's sort of shaping the early development of the school. A second influence is obviously um, transatlantic currents of functionalist modernism in architecture and design. Again, developments in the US, um, as well as in Europe, right? Amongst the European influences, clearly the Bauhaus um, looms large. Amongst the original group of instructors at the school when it first opened were three individuals who, in fact, had some training at the Bauhaus. Um, Hilda Rice and William Priestley, who were both interior designers, and Lila Ulrich who was a graphic designer, right, who actually could claim to have sort of first-hand experience with some of the pedagogical and design innovations um, developed at the Bauhaus during the 1920s and the early 1930s. Um, and supporters of the design laboratory, its faculty, its students, its other proponents, um, on the one hand, tried very much to sort of lay claim to the Bauhaus's um, legacy, such as it was already in the past tense, um, in the middle of the 1930s. Um, again, trying to sort of, you know, claim, you know, sort of the prestige that the school had already earned for itself. At the same time, um, that they often describe what they're doing at the design laboratory as trying to create, quote unquote, an American Bauhaus. They also emphasize continually the ways in which they're trying to move beyond um, the pedagogical and design approaches at the Bauhaus, um, which some of the you know, pragmatist-minded individuals at the design laboratory already saw by the middle of the 1930s as tending away from true functionalism to a kind of formalism um, that kind of mimicked um, you know, the outward sort of superficial trappings of functionality 
in the use of objects or the use of, of physical spaces or the built um, environments to photograph, obviously, of the complex in Dessa that was opened in the mid-1920s. Um, Obviously, there's, there are Americans who are beginning to embrace this kind of functionalist architecture as well. George Howe um, and William Lescaze, among sort of the early um, sort of receptive members of, of, you know, within the United States of this kind of functionalist modernism. This is a promotional illustration for the Philadelphia Savings Fund Society building. Um, still, you know, personally, one of my favorite buildings in the United States. Um, and then actually a photograph of the complete building, not long after its completion. Um, and we also see elements of the federal government um, begin to adopt this kind of functionalist modernism um, in the 1930s as well, although certainly there are multiple different um, you know, aesthetic strategies that um, the federal government is using to try to promote the ideals of the New Deal during the 1930s. Um, you know, one really clear effort to not just promote functionalist modernism, but to clearly link it to sort of the social democratic aspirations um, of the New Deal. Um, again, to sort of make functionalist modernism stand as a symbol for, you know, socialization of the economy, the social provisioning of goods and services, um, comes through some of the early innovations in public housing in the United States. Um, this is a photograph of the Williamsburg houses under construction in the late 1930s. Um, William Lescaze, right, one of the designers of the PSFS building in Philadelphia, is in fact part of the team of architects that designed this housing project for the New York City Housing Authority um, in the later 1930s. And again, just an illustration you know, showing you know, the determination of, of modernists to try to sort of cut against the existing um, right, aesthetic patterns, or in this case, to cut against sort of the existing um, urban fabric of this particular section, the Williamsburg section um, of Brooklyn, where um, this development was constructed. A third, and even sort of more ambivalent influence, is the emergence of commercial industrial design during the 1930s. The 1930s is really the period um, when industrial design emerges as a profession of its own. Um, obviously, the Great Depression represents one of the more significant economic catastrophes in American history. It represents a profound crisis for consumer capitalism as it had developed in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it creates a real sort of opening um, for the first generation of commercial industrial designers, figures like Norman Bel Geddes, Raymond Lowy, um, Walter Dorwin Teague to really kind of in establish themselves as commercial design entrepreneurs um, who are sort of heralded by the companies that employ them to redesign consumer goods, um, to redesign retail spaces, to redesign advertising and packaging as individuals who through their design are going to somehow stimulate consumer demand, right, and help essentially design um, American capitalism's way to economic recovery in the midst of the crisis of the 1930s, right? And these are designers who promote not a functionalist modernism, but a very expressive, ornamented modernism that we associate most prominently with the kind of streamlined style um, of the 1930s. Um, this is a cold spot refrigerator that Raymond Lowy designed for Sears um, in 19. 36. Um, again, you're know, trying to sort of evoke expressively some of the ideas of modernity, in this case, particularly a modernity that's not trending towards social democracy or the social provisioning of goods, um, but one where capitalism itself and consumer capitalism in America sort of renewed and restored. Um, in some cases, proponents of streamlining you know, can make some claims to um, you know, the idea that streamlining was in fact functional, that we're, you know, reducing, um, you know, wind resistance, for instance. This is a train for the New York Central Railroad System, the Mercury that um, noted industrial designer Henry Dreyfus designed in, in, the, in 1937. Um, frequently, of course, um, streamlining was not functional at all. I mean, unless you're going to get really frustrated and, like, you know, heave this, uh, your pencil sharpener down the hallway or in one of your colleagues, you know, there's not, it's not like the streamlining is, is making this pencil sharpener any faster, right? <laughs> um, but again, it's sort of like, and it, the emphasis here is not on functionality, but on expression, right? On creating essentially ornaments for modernity, 
Um, Right, and so the, the, the relationship between you know, this type of modernism and industrial design and the design laboratory is always um, ambiguous um, and tenuous. By the end of the decade, um, this sort of streamlined aesthetic promoted by these commercial industrial designers is put on display in a large scale at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Norman Bel Geddes designed um, the Futurama exhibition for General Motors. Um, this is the exterior of the building, and of course, large crowds that lined up day after day after day during the fair to uh, attend the exhibit. Um, now, clearly, given you know their interest in transatlantic functionalist modernism, given the influence of progressive era thinkers like John Dewey and Thorsten Veblen, um, in general, the faculty and students of the design laboratory are somewhat hostile to say the least, to the kind of expressive, streamlined vision of modernity that's being promoted by Belgettis, Lowy, Dreyfus, Teague, um, and the other um, industrial designers who are really prominent during this period, during the 1930s. But at the same time, the people responsible for launching the school are very much aware of the cultural prominence of industrial design, the ways in which figures like Belgettis like Lowy are essentially kind of cultural celebrities in the midst of the Great Depression. So Pollock, Cahill, the other individuals in the FEP, FAP who are responsible for launching the school are also um, desirous of trying to sort of appropriate some of the cultural cachet of the emerging industrial design profession, even as they are in aesthetic and ideological terms opposed to much of what these commercial industrial designers are trying to accomplish. So as part of their efforts to try to sort of give the new school credibility to establish its reputation, um, they in fact ask and get several prominent commercial <coughs> industrial designers to sit on the board of directors of the school. I mean, this is mostly a board of directors that is there, again, just to be sort of names on the letterhead. Um, you know, these are not, for the most part, people who are really involved with running the school in any way. Um, but by listing them as sponsors and as people on the board of directors, um, the founders of the school nonetheless hope to sort of help to establish its legitimacy um, and its reputability as a school. Um, and one individual sort of from that commercial design background um, who is a little bit more involved with the school is the furniture designer Gilbert Rohde. Um, who during the 30s did design work for the Kroller Company, um, and some work in the 30s also for the Herman Miller um, Furniture Company um, as well, even though his work for them is not as well known as the post-World War II work for Herman Miller that's done by George Nelson and Associates. Um, you know, having Rhodey on the letterhead as being the director, again, is a way of trying to appropriate for the school some of the um, sort of buzz surrounding the commercial industrial design profession as it's taking shape um, during this period. Rhodey himself, again, was not very much involved with the actual running of the school. There was an assistant director um, under him who mostly was involved with sort of the day-to-day -day activities um, of the school, but nonetheless is a publicity photo um, <laughs> taken by the FAP of Rhodey sort of, you know, again, getting the hands-on work, you know, actually working um, on a model in the school's shop. Um, I want to sort of turn our attention now to thinking about the context of the New Deal and its efforts to promote cultural democracy and how we sort of understand the design laboratory within that setting. Again, the design laboratory is just one initiative um, within these efforts to promote cultural democracy um, during the 1930s. Again, it's just one initiative within the Federal Art Project, right, which is just one of the four cultural projects. And of course, there's a wide array of other kinds of cultural activities that the New Deal is supporting. Again, to try to make culture in America more democratic in several ways. One way is making it democratic in the terms of making it more accessible, um, making various forms of culture available to people in ways that they had not before. You know, having the Federal Theater Project, for instance, perform plays um, in isolated areas, in rural areas, um, where people simply had no exposure to that kind of culture before. Um, another way in which New Dealers thought about cultural democracy was not just the idea of making culture accessible, but also making it more participatory, giving more individuals an opportunity to shape culture, more individuals 
from marginal backgrounds, from disadvantaged backgrounds, to try to you know, create culture as well. It's also worth keeping in mind that modernism of the functionalist type or any other type is by far and away um, from being the sole or even the principal aesthetic strategy that the New Deal utilized to try to promote its various you know, social and political objectives. Um, in many ways, we want to think about the New Deal and all of the various social and political you know, programs that are initiated during it, things we still you know, very much enjoy today, like Social Security, for instance. Um, you know, the New Deal is very provisional, very, very experimental. Um, you know, New Deal planners and administrators you know, would try various programs. If a program worked, it would be expanded. If it wasn't working, it would be discontinued. And that kind of sort of provisional experimental approach does not just apply to public policy, to programs like Social Security or unemployment insurance do, during the New Deal. It also is a way of thinking about this kind of scattershot approach to aesthetics. Um, and using different aesthetic strategies to try to represent what is, in fact, sort of a provisional and experimental expansion um, of American social democracy during the 1930s. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind, you know, that at the same time that you know the design laboratory represents one of the ways in which the New Deal federal government, the New Deal state, is trying to harness. Um, the aesthetic power of modernism, it's using other aesthetic strategies as well. One thing to keep in mind, of course, is the persistence uh, of, of neoclassicism in public architecture. And certainly during the same time that the federal government sponsoring the design laboratory and the sort of cutting edge innovative uh, modernist design and pedagogy in New York City, it's you know, building a pile of, of neoclassical <laughs> buildings down in Washington, DC. And certainly the neoclassicism um, of the 1930s is in some ways kind of simplified, you know, one maybe could describe it as kind of a modernized neoclassicism compared to, you know, Beaux-Arts eclecticism of the late 19th or early 20th century, but certainly it represents a very, very different sort of aesthetic strategy for representing the New Deal state and the programs of the New Deal state than the kind of modernism that's on display with the design laboratory. And, at the same time, we also have the promotion and celebration of various kinds of vernacular and folk architecture. Um, even within the Federal Arts Project, the largest single pro um, program of the FAP was, in fact, the Index of American Design that's headed by Constance Rourke, a cultural historian, which is an effort to sort of um, identify and then document um, examples and instances of sort of vernacular and decorative arts from the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries in the United States. Some FAP administrators, Holger Cahill in particular, um, who was the head of the national FAP, um, saw you know, the support for folk art and vernacular art and the support for modern art and modernism as not being mutually exclusive. In Cahill's mind, these were actually sort of reinforcing as he was an enthusiast um, of both folk and vernacular art and modern art. I mean, and this stems back even to his work as a curator at the Museum of Modern Art prior to his appointment as the head of the National Federal Art Project in 1935. Um, very quickly, it becomes clear, in, even in the first year of operations for the school, that FAP administrators, uh, on the one hand, and the students and faculty at the, on the, at the school on the other have very sort of different ideas about what the purpose of the school should be. Cahill and some of the other administrators at the FAP um, very much see the design laboratory as a source of staffing for other federal arts projects programs scattered around the country. Right? In their mind, individuals are maybe going to spend even just six or 12 months at the design laboratory and then go you know, run some sort of craft education program in Appalachia um, or something like that. The faculty and students at the design laboratory have a very different ideas. They actually want, um, even though technically this is a temporary operation, right, like all parts of the WPA, this is a relief operation designed, you know, on a temporary basis to deal with the, pro the problems of very severe mass unemployment. Um, during the 1930s. Um, most of the students and faculty, though, are interested in trying to establish the school on a permanent basis.
to develop, you know, ultimately a multi-year structured curriculum to eventually turn the school into the kind of school that offers, you know, essentially a four-year curriculum and a bachelor's degree um, in design. And they are much more attuned towards um, career opportunities and other opportunities within New York's culture industries, right? They see themselves yes, as students who are ultimately going to go work. Um, you know, in design work of some kind, you know, in New York for an ad agency, for instance, or for, you know, some other kind of design firm. They're not really interested um, in leaving New York and heading out to the sticks, um, you know, to teach some kind of extension program for the FAP. So these disagreements sort of fester over time and sort of gradually weaken support um, for the school within the FAP, especially for Holger Cahill, who sort of whose early enthusiasm for the school sort of wanes over time um, as he realizes that it's not going to provide a way for him to sort of staff um, you know, and obtain personnel for other projects that the FAP is engaged in. Uh, and so instead, you see the students and the faculty focus on sort of developing the school, um, improving and refining um, its pedagogy and its curriculum. Um, already by the end of 1936, they expand the curriculum to a three-year program. Um, now, this is very ambitious for a school that ostensibly is a temporary expedient, right, that is essentially existing without a permanent basis, right, only to deal with the immediate problem of mass unemployment within the United States, right? So by the end of 1936, we see the the mission of the FAP administrators and the mission of those individuals as faculty or as students in the school increasingly beginning to diverge. Just more, more photographs. Um, you know, even though in some ways the, the curriculum and pedagogy become more advanced over time, it's actually the sort of earliest experimental period of the school while it was under FAP control that's sort of best documented visually. All right, so these are students at work in one of the graphic design classes at the school uh, in 1936. Um, just a close up of someone who's actually um, you know, at work on their easel. Just a couple of examples of student work. Um, you know, again, as part of sort of the first year's um, graphic design courses in 1936. Um, Again, you know, this constant effort on sort of learning by doing, on practicality, um, you know, on making people um, produce sort of models for, um, you know, the actual, actual product design that are, don't just look functional, but are actually are functional, right? You're not allowed to design a clock if you can't actually insert the mechanism to make the clock work inside um, the casing for um, example, right? This is a woman that's working in a shop on one of the lathes. Um, speaking of clocks, right, this is a group of clocks that are sort of designed by some of the, the first years of students in 1936. Um, we see here sort of a mixture of functionalism, but also some of the kind of expressive modernism that we associate with the material culture of, of streamlining and you know, commercial industrial design during the 1930s, um, evident um, in some of these as well. Um, that's another just example of sort of early product design at the school with this cigarette um, case and ashtray that was designed by a laboratory student in 1936. We also need to think about the context of the design laboratory um, in terms of creative labor and again this sort of surge um, in union militancy amongst cultural workers that takes place during the 1930s. This is a period where we see the first efforts to unionize in the motion picture industry with the formation of the Screen Actors Guild and the Screen Writers Guild. This is a period where we see the initial efforts to unionize successfully people who work in journalism and the print media with the foundation of the Newspaper Guild Union in 1933. Um, we also have other efforts to unionize um, commercial artists of various kinds, architects and designers and engineers of various kinds, um, efforts successfully to unionize people working in broadcasting during this period. So this is another important context for the development of the design laboratory is this surge in kind of militancy um, amongst creative workers, um, who people who want to be not just the instruments of cultural production, but to be the agents 
of cultural production as well, and to have enjoy agency on the job, um, to have you know some real influence over the kind of culture they're creating, and of course to work under conditions where they can actually earn a living. Um, not easy to do necessarily in the economically pressed conditions of the 1930s. Um, and it's also worth keeping in mind that it's agitation on the part of these pro-union cultural workers that actually leads to the creation of the four cultural projects, um, including the Federal Arts Project in the first place. Um, you know, the federal government doesn't decide to give jobs to thousands and thousands of cultural workers just because we had a really nice guy in a wheelchair um, as our president, right? We, this happened ultimately because of pressure from below, right? That there was agitation, there was protest, um, you know, on the part of, um, you know, people who are out of work artists, out of work journalists, out of work musicians, um, people who are out of work in, in other fields of cultural production, um, who demand the federal government not just deal with the problems of unemployed factory workers, but who want the federal government to deal with the problems of underemployment and unemployment amongst white collar workers, amongst people who work in the culture industries um, as well. So in part, you know, the, the whole fact that there is a federal arts project that can even start a school like the Design Laboratory itself is in large part sort of due to the sort of grassroots organizing from below um, on the part of the various cultural workers unions. Um, in particular in New York City, which by the 1930s has already sort of established itself with the conspicuous exception of motion picture production is really kind of the hub of the production of sort of mass consumer culture in the United States. Just a membership card from the artists union um, that organized not just freelance artists but also commercial artists in New York during um, the 1930s. Um, and they, as I mentioned, you know, members of these unions very much are active in sort of demonstrating and protesting to get the federal government to provide a level of support for the arts um, that had not existed previously and that has not existed since. Um, I mean, the federal arts projects, the cultural projects of the WPA were not just without precedent in American history. There's also been nothing like them in American history since um, the era of the New Deal. Um, in many cases, these workers, in fact, go on strike against their employers. Um, these are members of the Newspaper Guild of New York um, on strike against the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper um, in 1937. This is ultimately a, a long fought but successful strike um, that forces the newspaper to recognize the Newspaper Guild um, to provide substantial improvements in pay and conditions to journalists and to the other white collar workers whose labor made the production of a daily newspaper um, possible. Um, even in advertising, um, even though people who work for advertising agencies have less success organizing than white collar workers in other cultural fields, we nonetheless see with the American Advertising Guild an effort to unionize people who work in the ad agencies. And um, this is a protest um, in 1939 against one, a small agency, the Gusar Khan Agency, that did a lot of sort of display advertising for New York um, retailers, which is why these ad workers were actually protesting out in front of the Lord & Taylor um, <laughs> flagship department store in this picture, and of course using some of their commercial art skills as well. Some yoke, hey boss, with overtime. Um, right, the World's Fair, but Gusar Khan um, isn't, you know, on the other sign over there. Right, so this is another important part of the context for understanding the design laboratory um, and its development um, during this period. And again, there's sort of a larger sense um, that affects these white collar workers who are unionizing and many of the people who are faculty and students who are union supporters at the school about even sort of on a more broad scale um, what the real position of white collar workers is within the society and the economy. Um, are white collar workers inherently part of a middle class, right, whose interests are aligned to some extent with employers, with business, with capital, or are white collar workers, people who, in, even people who do creative work, who make art, who engage in journalism, are these people actually part of the proletariat? Or are they maybe part of some new class um, that's distinct from the old traditional middle class and that maybe even though they're not part of the proletariat still has political um, goals that are ultimately aligned with working people. 
Um, the great 1930s artist Elizabeth Olds tried to sort of capture this dynamic in her allegorical um, lithograph, the middle class, in which we see um, members of the middle of the sort of the white collar middle class who are hemmed in into this pen, um, being sort of deluded and dazzled by these kind of crypto fascist figures at the front. I um, mean, this individual is actually holding up a, a swastika and an American flag together. Um, at the same time, we also see people within the group who are suddenly sort of escaping out the back to join. Um, the sort of large movement of working people, sort of representative of the 1930s popular front, the idea that white collar workers and blue collar workers had interests that were naturally aligned with each other. Right? So this kind of thinking is very, very important to the development of the design laboratory um, as well. Um, the WPA projects, including the design laboratory, are sites for very, very extensive organizing by these white collar unions. Um, you know, despite all the claims that these projects are temporary, these white collar unionists very much believe that and hope that they will be that these projects will be the beginning of a permanent federal commitment to the production of culture um, in the United States. Um, they lobby and protest for better pay on the projects, and they also begin to protest when the first cuts. Um, in funding and employment and staffing levels come to be announced um, in late 1936. Um, much to the dismay of Cahill and FAP administrators, um, faculty and students from the design laboratory are extremely active in some of the protests and occupations, in fact, of federal offices <laughs> in New York City to demand that funding for the design laboratory be expanded um, and that it be continued on a permanent basis. Um, ultimately, some of these demonstrations are kind of counterproductive and they sort of cause Cahill to sort of sour even more um, on the design laboratory, right? Not only is it not providing the kind of staffing that he's hoping for for other projects, it's also a hotbed of kind of radical agitation um, within the WPA it, at large um, in New York City. Um, ultimately, you know, the associate um, you know, director of the school, Josiah Marvel, who I, again is really doing sort of the day-to-day -day running of the school, ultimately is reprimanded by Cahill because of his, even though he's in charge of the school, he's actively supporting these demonstrators, these, again, who are engaging in occupations um, of various WPA offices in New York City during late 1936 and early 1937. Right. And that ultimately puts the design laboratory on the chopping block um, when wholesale um, deep cuts in funding for the WPA are announced in early 1937 um, as part of sort of a more general curtailment um, of federal expenditure. Um, Roosevelt and his advisors were hoping that after four years of weak um, recovery, the economy was strong enough for the federal government to curtail its role. Um, ultimately, the economy was still too weak. In fact, in 1937 and 38, there's a so-called Roosevelt recession, um, where the economy actually begins to decline again, where you have a spike in unemployment in 1937 and 38, largely because of the, the cuts in federal expenditure in 1937, of which the design laboratory is just one of many programs um, that get the ax. Um, but here, the an interest in white collar unionism on the part of faculty and students becomes handy um, because they are able to reach out to one of these white collar unions, the Federation of Architects, Engineers, Chemists, um, and Technicians, at the FAECT, a white collar union um, that had, had been recently established and recently chartered by the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, um, to organize technical and professional workers within these various fields. And the union essentially agrees to continue the school as a cooperative, essentially as a project of the labor union. Um, right? So here we see the laboratory moving into the second phase of its existence from mid-1937 to mid-1938, when it is sort of directly under the sponsorship of this sort of fledgling, upstart, militant, white-collar um, labor union. So like, I, I need to interrupt you. Uh, some of the students need to now uh, prepare for a, a six o'clock class. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, those who want to stick around, of course, it's the, the, the story continues, but those of you who need to head off to your six o'clock class. I will only take just a few more yeah. minutes. I realize we're at about a quarter till. Yeah. Um, this is just a f poster, um, actually a brochure, rather, from sort of the 
reorganization of the school, right? You know, on the one hand, informing everybody that formerly, it, formerly yeah. part of the Federal Arts Project, but now part of this union's um, educational uh, undertakings. And it's during this time, again, they sort of revised the curriculum again. They moved to a four-year curriculum, right? Again, sort of setting the stage for actually being able to offer bachelor's degrees. Um, they instituted a new materials laboratory course that is modeled in part on the foundations course that had been developed at the Bauhaus during the 1920s, and also a new two-semester design synthesis sequence. Um, and they also add a fair amount of coursework in what we might consider the social sciences. Right, so mandatory courses in sociology, mandatory courses in labor history for people who are ultimately going to end up being you know, graphic designers, product designers, interior designers, um, sort of the three fields in which you see most of the students at the school um, gravitating. This is just a sort of a, a collage of student work from 1938. Um, this chair, I know, was designed by the furniture and housewares designer Don Wallace, one of the ultimately sort of more successful um, of the alumna of the school, um, who goes on to sort of have a long career in post-war um, design. Um, this little sort of, I know that just from interviewing her actually a few years ago, this sort of mock-up of sort of an interior design was done by a woman named Suzanne Seeke, um, who spent most of the post-war years as an interior designer with George Nelson's um, agency, again, sort of contributing to this kind of refined, sort of high modernist style in post-war. America, I mean, a sort of little display from the materials laboratory course um, as well. Um, they weren't about <laughs> sort of self-parody as well. Um, you know, even as they promoted this very sort of rigorous um, functionalist approach to modernism, sort of, you know, disdainful of, of the expressive ornament of a sort of, of, a, of streamlined modernity, they could at least um, have a good laugh at themselves, right? So here we see a, this is a cartoon from the school's newsletter. Um, where on the one hand we see this student, you know, a student who's being quite literally burned alive for trying to streamline a coffee pot, and yet another student who's engaging in the experimental method of the materials laboratory course. You know, what, is, what does this material do uh, under particular circumstances? Let's take some notes, you know, of our little um, experiment here. As they turn against the expressive modernism of commercial industrial design, they also are ultimately find themselves fighting to define functionalism. And, you know, in some ways, in their disagreements with the, the streamline, um, the proponents of streamlining who are commercial industrial designers, if the aesthetic lines are pretty clear and sort of the political lines are also pretty clear. Um, it's different when they're trying to not just promote functionalist modernism as a style, but to also establish its social meanings to establish it as a style, as a look, as an aesthetic that is indicative of social democracy, of an expanded sort of role of the public sector, of an expanded role for the social provisioning of various goods and service. Um, and this leads to sort of their ambiguous relationship with institutions like the Museum of Modern Art, which is also interested in promoting functionalist modernism at this time, but is also sort of, in some cases, almost you know, without thinking in the process of defining functionalist modernism as a canon, right? As sort of a formalist canon that signifies not social democracy, um, but elite status, refinement. Um, so on the one hand, they, they want to sort of collaborate with institutions like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but they're also trying to promote a, a single aesthetic, but trying to sort of establish different social and cultural meanings of that aesthetic. Right, this just a shot from the um, Bauhaus retrospective exhibition that staged um, actually um, the year before or a few months before completion of the Ed Stone building on East 53rd Street. So they were actually using temporary space inside of Rockefeller Center to stage this particular exhibition, which for many Americans really was their first introduction to Bauhaus pedagogy, um, Bauhaus style and aesthetics. Um, Herbert Beyer, who actually had taught at the Bauhaus and would eventually, um, in the 1940s and 50s, go on to the faculty of the Illinois Institute of Technology with Mies van der Rohe, um, helps to curate the exhibit. The design laboratory gets, is sort of included, but only as a footnote. Um, there's a sort of a small sample, and not just of the, not of the actual products, but of the kind of experimental sculptures. Um, that are sort of student exercises within the materials laboratory and the design synthesis courses. Um, you know, sort of only barely acknowledging the role of this very vital, vibrant school 
um, you know, within the United States. It, of course, is competing with the Museum of Modern Art to try to establish the social and cultural meanings of functionalist modernism during this period. Um, this is just, again, as, as another example of the efforts of, of the unions and, and the cultural left to try to appropriate modernism, just a, a graphic that um, Ad Reinhardt designed for the United Office and Professional Workers Unions, which was sort of an umbrella organization for many of the white collar groups um, of unions in New York City. Um, this is actually a graphic he created to promote their health plan. Um, one of the benefits of the union was they actually established their own health insurance program. And he has sort of indicated in very sort of you know, functionalist graphic um, outline the various kinds of workers. The numbers correspond with the various union locals that were part of the joint council in New York City for this union. Um, the school reorganized for a second time in the middle of 1938 as a completely independent school. Um, you know, the union was an ideologically hospitable sponsor, but the union, too, was having its own problems with financial stability, especially with the renewed recession conditions of the late 1930s. Um, there's a slight change in the title of the school from Design Laboratory to Laboratory School of Industrial Design. And it's at this point they actually are formally um, authorized by the New York State Board of Regents to actually begin giving bachelor's degrees out to people. I mean, to really be sort of an, a, a full-fledged institution of higher learning um, that's independent and on its own. Um, but much like the union that had sponsored it, the school is not really able to work out a viable financial basis for itself. Um, you know, in many ways, this sort of last period is a period that's sort of most interesting in terms of the sort of pedagogical and curricular innovations. Um, you have, you know, many new people joining the faculty. Paul Rand, right, who makes a career for himself as what's sort of a leading graphic designer and as a professor of graphic design at Yale, as actually comes on to the faculty um, in the late 30s. He's only 24 years old. He's practically the same age as many of his students. Um, you know, at this point, um, industrial designer Peter Schlabermund, who has a very extensive career after World War II, comes on to the faculty at this time. So in many ways, it's intellectually and educationally the most promising period. Um, but ultimately, they're not able to solve the problem of patronage to establish a firm financial basis um, for the school. And certainly, the, the sort of the disorganization of the political front, social, and cultural movement that comes in the fall of 1939 with the outbreak of World War II in Europe, um, the unwillingness after that point of certain anti-communist liberals to continue to cooperate in certain endeavors with people who were more pro-communist in their outlook, also makes it difficult to sort of corral the kind of financial resources that would be necessary. Uh, it suspends operations in late 1939 and then formally relinquishes its charter in the spring of 19. 40. And I suppose we're pretty much out of time. Um, just a couple of things about legacies. Um, one is that, you know, even though the school goes out of existence, its faculty and students disperse um, throughout the American system of higher education, throughout our systems of cultural institutions. Um, you know, William Friedman and Hilda Rice, for instance, go teach at the University of Iowa, and then in the 1940s move to Minneapolis, where they help um, launch Everyday Art Quarterly and all the design programming associated with the Walker Art Center um, in Minneapolis. That's all design laboratory um, former instructors. Um, I mentioned you know students who go on to careers in their own right. Suzanne Siki, who's a very prominent interior designer through the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, even into the early 2000s, when I interviewed her around 2004, I think she was 92 or 93 years old, and she was just giving up her office, <laughs> um, her studio space, um, where she was still actually doing interior design work. And this was around 2003 or 2000. Um, and for Don Wallace, um, again, had an extensive career as a flatware um, designer, a housewares designer, um, and in the mid-50s wrote a book called Shaping America's Products, which is still to this day, I think, for, as a sort of a case study approach, one of the most interesting um, surveys and studies of different types of product design and industrial design in post-World War II um, America. You know, instructors like Paul Rand, of course, who go on to very you know, successful careers as graphic designers and as teachers of graphic um, design. So certainly, you know, its students, its faculty are scattered and sort of carry on its legacy 
Um, I think it remains useful as a sort of a model of a kind of cooperative educational or cultural institution. Um, again, we want to think about how we democratize culture, how we give people an opportunity to participate um, in sort of shaping culture and shaping the institutions that create culture. Certainly, there's a lot to look back to the example of the design laboratory um, and sort of to, to emulate or be inspired by in that regard. Um, you know, and I think its history, again, provides a real reminder of what was truly radical um, about modernist design in 1930s America. Um, you know, that it might, in fact, become not just a prevalent aesthetic, but an aesthetic that really represented and symbolized the aspirations of New Deal social democracy. Um, you know, of, of creating a world in which goods and services were socially provided and socially available. Um, you know, in a way that ultimately was never achieved. You know, that it was not just a, a formalist kind of modernism, you know, again, that, you know, represented refinement, elite status, um, like we might associate with sort of the canonical project of the Museum of Modern Art and some of its curators, um, but that it really did have a kind of radical um, potential. And I hope that we sort of, when we think about modernism in the 1930s, we sort of keep in mind that the potential sort of latent radical power uh, a modernist design in that period. So thank you all thank you. very much. Really appreciate you as an audience. I know I've used up a fair amount of time. I don't know if there's any questions that people have. Or yeah. Excellent talk. Do you think people nowadays in 2018 view modernism totally different than they did back in the 1930s? Um, I think that in many ways I think sort of the radical sort of political or social potential, I think, is sort of lost. I mean, to the extent that people sort of pay attention to, especially functionalist modernism, I mean, they sort of, I think, often do sort of see it as signifying refinement, um, education, um, you know, a sort of, sort of highbrow kind of cultural taste, and, and not as something that really, you know, symbolizes, again, sort of a, the possibility of, so, of social democracy, of, of having universal health care. You know, of, of having sort of widespread affordable housing as provided by the public sector, um, free public education. Um, you know, these are all the kinds of things, you know, even appliances, you know, for your home that might be made by a cooperative or sold by some sort of nonprofit or public entity. Um, you know, these are all the things that were very much on the table in the 1930s. Um, as things that, you know, were not just um, what the students and faculty of the school hoped for, but things that at least seemed like they could be achieved. Um, and so for them, the sort of the struggle to make, not just to promote a particular aesthetic, but to make that aesthetic sort of stand for, to symbolize um, you know, these sort of radical social democratic ideals, I think that I think really is lost um, in the way that most people sort of view or think about this kind of sort of functional modernism that, again, in the post-World War II period really becomes kind of like a high modernism. Um, so in that, in that regard, I, I think that there is a difference. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Well, there are many thoughts, but we, they might be spreading upwards. I mean, I, I was thinking about what I was looking at right now. I, mean, I was thinking about uh, Nazi Germany uh, adopting it and then moving away from it, and, and Communist Russia adopting it and staying with it, and, and, and going with uh, the uh, initial movements of the, of the suprematists and, and futurists. Right, I mean, where you see it sort of, again, sort of its radical potential early in the Soviet Revolution and then the Soviet yes. regime under Stalin sort of abandoning modernism as a style in many ways. Um, you know, sort of a de-emphasis by the 1930s of suprematism, constructivism, sort of a turn towards, you know, what's often described as kind of a social realist aesthetic. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in sort of the public culture and the visual culture of the Soviet Union by the 30s and 40s. Um, and in Germany, of course, the Bauhaus is put out of business by the, you know, the Nazis when they seize power. One of the first things they do is they shut the school because they think modern design is degenerate. Yeah, but the, the socialist uh, concept is there, and yet they, they went... Right, I mean, they choose a form of neoclassicism as their yes. sort of preferred aesthetic strategy. Instead. Not unlike you know a certain portion of the New Deal, right? To represent what they see as being sort of the goals, the ideals, yeah. you know, sort of the political and social values of the, of the Nazi regime. Yeah. No, absolutely. Any other comments or? 
questions? Well, thank you all. I think we're finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.